morning, guys. Please just ignore the committee meeting stuff. Um, so, like Mr. D said, I am a fourth year graduate student at NYU School of Medicine. Um, I am in the molecular pharmacology program, uh, but my project is really interesting the fact that it combines sort of pharmacology, molecular biology, and cancer biology. So I'm going to walk you through this today. So the title of this is just really defining the importance of translational regulation. I'm going to explain what that means in a tamoxifen-resistant phenotype. So the major issue with breast cancer, especially ER-positive breast cancer, is the fact that you can develop resistance to this. So about 30% of patients with the ER positive disease will have de novo resistance, meaning that they have some type of mutation <coughs> in either their cytochrome P450 enzyme, which is responsible for metabolizing tamoxifen, or in their estrogen receptor, in which it takes on a different conformation or cannot bind. But that's not really the important part to us, right? Because those patients will be resistant regardless. Our you know, pool that we're really interested in is this 40 to 50 percent of patients that are treated adjuvantly for five to ten years with tamoxifen and then relapse. And so they come back into the clinic and they their tumor has come back, is now more aggressive, and it may have actually metastasized the brain, lungs, and other distant organs. And so this is a big problem because this is what's actually causing the mortality of these patients. What's interesting though is that these patients don't lose the estrogen receptor. It's still expressed. So the question then becomes how is it that you have patients that know that still have the drug target but are no longer responsive to the drug, right? And so this is what my research is really focused on, trying to better understand that. And so we have a cell line model of this disease. And so this cell line was derived from MCEF7s, and these are ER positive. Um, adenocarcinoma of the breast. And so they were put into mice, they were cultured, they were put back into mice, and then we were able to develop these two different um, cell lines. We have a sensitive cell line, which is responsive to 4 hydroxy tamoxifen, which is the active metabolite of tamoxifen, and then we have a resistant cell line, which they, the sensitive cell line were selected against uh, to make sure that they were a resistant population. So the first thing you want to do anytime you have a model is you want to test your model to make sure it works. And so tamoxifen, what it generally does, it accumulates cells, uh, sensitive cells, into G1. And so we look here, and so when I treat with this drug for 72 hours, we see a significant increase of the sensitive cells into G1, which means it's stalling the cell cycle. It's fundamentally causing the cells to fail their G1S checkpoint and accumulates them into G1. You see a drop out of, of S phase, and you even see a decrease in the G2M phase. But in the resistant cells, this is not the case. You also see differences in proliferation over time, and you also see a decrease in colony formation. So what this assay does is you see single cells. Oh, yes. Uh, so we have pressure here. You don't know what the cell cycle okay. is yet. Got it. So <laughs> the cell cycle is how cells go through mitosis, how they divide, and so they there's two phases, there's interphase, and then there's M phase. And so interphase is really where the cell is sort of resting, and that's G1. S phase is when you have DNA replication, and then G2 is sort of the cell saying, okay, I'm, I'm big enough, my DNA is replicated, let's get ready to go through mitosis, and then you go through M phase, which is mitosis, and then that's where you have chromosomal segregation and, and so on and so forth to learn all about that when you get to that point. Um, again, and so I see a, a difference in proliferation. Again, that sort of goes along with this uh, G1 continuation. Yes. So you're saying that in G, um, because they are not yet resistant, they're slowing, uh, they're stopping the growth, which is why there there are bigger bars in G1. Absolutely. So we look here. So this is a DMSO treatment, which is sort of just um, a vehicle means it should not have any effect on the cells and then the drug tamoxifen. And so we see that there's an accumulation, which means that the cells are fundamentally, they're not replicating their DNA, and then they're stalling and staying in G1 phase. And that's what's happening, okay? And then we see differences in the ability of the cells to sort of form colonies or small tumors on, on, um, on plates. So there's a lot of mechanisms that have been proposed about how this resistance comes about. 
So there's this transcriptional aspect, which sort of we, we can understand, right? If you have the estrogen receptor, which is the target of this drug, then maybe there's some type of differential transcription. Maybe some genes are being transcribed while other genes are not. Maybe there's different recruitment of cofactors to different promoter regions, and so on and so forth. But that research has been done exhaustively. What has not been done, though, is, the, is looking at post-transcriptional regulation. So regulation that's occurring after the mRNA has been made. And that's where we're going here. So there are these cell surface receptors. These are EGFRs. They are usually on a lot of different cells. Uh, but they're main, there are a lot of them on um, breast cancer cells. And so they respond to things like insulin. They'll respond to growth hormones. So these are how your cells sort of stay alive, proliferate, survive, how you grow, how you develop. These pathways become extremely important in developmental biology. They become important in cell migration and how when you start out as an embryo, how is it that this cell knows to go to your brain and another cell knows to go to your foot, right? You don't want a foot cell in your brain, right? That would be good. Uh, and so we also have pathway upregulation, and these are the two main pathways that I work on. I'm not going to go through this in detail, um, but essentially you see, I really focus on this pathway right here. mTOR is a cellular kinase responsible for growth, survival, proliferation, basically for a cell to be a cell. And ultimately what this all feeds down on is this initiation complex right here. Now this, get, this is where it gets a little bit um, challenging, but I'm going to walk you through this. So mRNAs have to be made into proteins, right? And in order to do that, you have to somehow initiate this. So one of the processes that happens after mRNA has been made is it gets cap, right? And this cap gets recognized by this protein here, EIF4E, which is the protein I mainly work on. And this protein recruits a lot of other proteins, it recruits the ribosome, you get translation, awesome, right? You're making proteins, you're living, you're happy, you're going. So we wanted to know, could somewhere down here really lie a reason behind this resistant phenotype? So uh, this might be a little bit hard to see. I apologize for that. Uh, so I looked at the different factors, and I'm working on cleaning this up a little bit. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, so I'm working on cleaning this up a little bit. But you can see here, if we look at 4A, which is the helix, seems to be pretty consistent between two cell lines, 4G. I don't know what happened here, something happened, we'll fix it, uh, but also pretty consistent. Now what we see here though is that 24 hours of treatment with this drug, tamoxifen, the resistant cells seem to maintain their levels of 4E. This is a western blot, so this is looking at protein levels. And this, uh, um, so at 24 hours we see that the sensitive cells seem to have some type of drop in their uh, 4E levels. So we want to know, okay, could 4E be the reason why we have sort of this resistant phenotype. So the first thing you do is say, okay, if we think it's this protein, let's get rid of it. Let's decrease the levels of this protein and see what happens, right? So that's what I did here. So again, we're looking at a Western blot. So I generated a, a construct that, is, that when I put into the cells and I turn it on, they, it binds the mRNA for 4E, it binds and it causes this uh, uh, degradation. And so that mRNA can no longer be made into protein. And so, you can see here we have a, a reduction of protein. So, well, could it be in, uh, uh, well, I took out this graph, I'm sorry, but it does slow proliferation slightly, I'll show you that. But PARP is um, a sort of a marker we use for looking at apoptosis, which is cell death, right? So we don't see any cleave PARP, the levels of PARP seem to be the same, so it doesn't seem to be apoptosis. All right. Can you, would you mind doing those stickers one more time, just yeah. summary-wise? Absolutely. So we see, in A, that there's the resistant cells maintain the levels of 4E. The sensitive cells is interesting because they have lower levels initially, but then they increase their levels over time with treatments. And this really is important because it suggests that 4E could actually uh, be a marker of early resistant phenotype. So then we silence 4E, and so we have this non-silencing construct here, right? So you can see that's there, then we degrade it. Actin is just being used as a loading control because you need to make sure that you're loading the same amount of protein into each lane so you can really say, well, are your differences real? And then we look here, when we silence for E, do we see difference? Do we see any cleave part? And cleave part <coughs> is a marker of apoptosis or cell death. 
We don't see that there. Therefore, we uh, conclude that the cells are not undergoing apoptosis when we silence 4E. So the next thing you want to do is say, OK, now let's kind of go back and look at the biology of this. So we're looking at cell cycle analysis once again. I just graphed it differently. But the important part is just look at these white bars here. So when I silence 4E and I treat the cells, the resistant cells, with tamoxifen, versus not silencing this protein, still treating it with tamoxifen, you see this accumulation of the cells into G1. So this is really surprising, right? Because remember, I told you before that the cells that are resistant do not accumulate into G1. They do not stall their cell cycle. They continue to proliferate in the presence of the drug. However, when I silence this protein, this one particular protein, I begin to see the cells start arresting, which means, are they becoming more sensitive to tamoxifen at this point? When you reduce the levels of this protein, this protein that's necessary for binding mRNA and initiating protein synthesis, when you get rid of that protein and you give the, the resistant cells this drug that they're supposed to be resistant to, they begin to have a sensitive phenotype again, right? We see this here. Again, they start to slow down their proliferation. And then we see here that they have significant reduction in colony formation. So you begin to wonder, could this really be a, a key point of maintaining a resistant phenotype? But this is not enough, right? You can't just conclude that from one experiment. So what I then did is there's a repressor, yes, five minutes. There's a repressor protein for ABP1, and I overexpress this. So then I'd say, OK, instead of reducing the levels of 4E, how about I overexpress its repressor and see if I can get a similar phenotype? And I do. Right? So this is the protein. This is the mRNA level. Uh, so you see, this is how I'm turning the system on. It's a doxycycline. Don't worry about that. But the system is on here, off here. When I do that here, I again begin to also see a reduction in colony formation, which is another readout of the cells being sensitive to tamoxifen. So that then leads to, OK, now what if I do the complete opposite? What if I take the sensitive cells and overexpress 4E, that, that cat binding protein? Can I force them to become resistant? So I've just started this part of my project. So I'm able to get this beautiful overexpression. You see it here. Uh, so the next thing I'm currently doing this experiment, results will be on Sunday. So you want to see, could this actually be the mechanism behind which cells are be resistant and how they're maintaining their resistant phenotype. I'm going to skip this. I just want to. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to end. So we have a drug in the lab that sort of is able to mimic this, uh, and it's called PP242. And PP242, what it does is it shuts down mTOR1 and mTOR2. Therefore, you constantly have 4E just not being able to function. That's really what this drug is doing. And when I treat the cells with that, again, I see the resistant cells not being able to proliferate as well as they usually can. Uh, the sensitive cells, it doesn't really matter because they're already sensitive. We don't even make them more sensitive, right? You get breast cancer, you get the toxin treatment, and it responds, you're good. The problem comes when they become resistant. So we need to find ways to make that better. So, yeah. Is this treatment targeted to the uh, specific cancer cells? Or if it's not, what the patient is not that for you? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, so this treatment is not specific to cancer cells. Um, the thing is, PP242 and things like rapamycin, these are can be immunosuppressive. They can have some nasty side effects. However, there's another counter drug, Inc. 128, it's very much like PP242, that is better tolerated by patients. Uh, and so the implications of what could happen is shutting down 4E in other cells is you can have um, some cell death. But the cancer field is very interesting and it's very different from other fields. And the fact that when you get to this stage of drug resistance, you're at a stage three, stage four breast carcinoma. This is generally deadly. So being able to, even if you can kill the tumor faster than you're sort of killing your other cells, which is how chemotherapy actually works give patients even three months extra of life, right? Which can be super significant when, I get up, so this can be super significant when you are 
when you have cancer, right? So the cancer field is really more concerned about can we just kill the tumor faster than we kill our other cells? And so that's what so the, the, the drug is doing. But we are, we do work with other companies to try and better understand the mechanisms of these drugs and their bioavailability and all that stuff. I'm actually starting a animal project that is going to take all of this data and put it into an animal model and really see if I can have a true sort of preclinical trial. And if that works, this will this work has the implication to go on to be one of the more successful clinical trials out there about drug resistance, uh, ER positive breast cancer. It's one of the most challenging subjects to study because of the fact that you just think, well, why are the cells resistant? They still have the estrogen receptor. There has to be some other mechanism involved. And so that's what I hope you take away from this is that I didn't show you any phosphorylation data. I'm sorry about that. Um, but that 4E seems to be a, a true mediator of this drug-resistant phenotype. Silencing this protein or overexpressing its repressor seems to give some type of partial um, resensitization to the resistant cells. And that hopefully it, we can really say that it's a true mediator of this resistant phenotype. And with that, I'll end and I'll take any questions that you have. Uh, so is the idea that you would, um, you know, target 4E after cancer has become resistant, or could you target it beforehand as sort of a preemptive measure to prevent it? That from is an resistant? excellent question, and we're actually doing some of those studies in the lab. So a paper came out of our lab, and several studies have been done about this. Normal cells, normal breast cells, have their balance of 4E is very intricate. Overexpressing 40, even 1.5 fold, can generate a tumor. Now the problem is, if you hit the cells before they have become cancerous, they don't rely on 40 as much as when they become cancerous. So the the effect that you would see is not as um, as drastic. So the thing about hitting them before they become resistant is that the sensitive cells sort of also don't have this, uh, this sort of dependence on 4E that the resistant cells do. And so targeting them with a 4E inhibitor, which they do exist, or shutting down TOR1 or TOR2 or such, doesn't seem to have the same effect as um, 